what happens then is that the brain in modern times will start to assume or decide that there's danger, even if there's really not. Mm -hmm. So to those folks who are going to an interview, they consciously know I'm not going to get killed. At least I hope not, you know, by the interviewer, but their nervous system is acting as if that's a hungry tiger that's about to pounce and literally eat them and kill them. Hi, I'm Renata Bernardi, and this is the Job Hunting Podcast, where I interview experts and professionals and discuss issues that are important for job hunters and those who are working to advance their careers. So make sure that you subscribe and follow, and let's dive right in. I'm very interested in this partnership, both of you coming together to write an interesting book, The Steadfast Leader, which I'm fascinated by. How did you two meet and where did this idea come from? Well, <laughs> well it's kind of a funny story how it happened. Brandy and I have been friends for years. And one night, I guess about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, we were having dinner and I always had an interest in, in psychology and, and being a psychiatrist, you know, it's certainly in his area. And I asked him some questions about some of the work and training that he was doing in somatic experiencing. And he started explaining to me what the SEP program is and what he was doing and the trainings that he was conducting. I thought, this is really interesting. This could really apply to leadership in business in general, in business decision-making. So therefore I said, you know, Randy, we should talk more about this. I think there's some compatibility there between business and psychology and melding this together to create uh, better business circumstances for people. That's really how the whole thing got started. And we went from there. And Randy, from your perspective, in your practice, have you seen a lot of stressed out white collar workers? <laughs> Is that what attracted you to work with your friend, Jeffrey? It would probably be the majority of the people who come to me just dealing with those, yeah, just the massive amount of stress right now. And with the additional knowledge that I had gained and how to deal with anxiety and stress really had kind of opened my eyes. And I think it really broadened my understanding and my skill base around how to approach things like stress, anxiety, nervousness, given that it really kind of added an additional amount of information that they didn't really teach us in our traditional training in medical school and in psychiatry training because traditional psychiatry and psychology is still very heavily steeped in what we call the cognitive models, how to work with your thinking brain. There was really a lot less attention paid on how do you work with the nonverbal part of the brain, which is down closer to the brainstem, or what some people call your animal or reptilian brain. And working with that part of the brain is it doesn't understand language. It doesn't understand words. And so this is why people often run into roadblocks or difficulties trying to deal with their anxiety, but doing it simply through thought or through words, which is the traditional approach. Oh, that's fascinating. As you can imagine, people that are listening to the Job Hunting podcast <laughs> struggle a lot with the reptilian brain. And as they go through that period between jobs or they're listening to this podcast because they're very dissatisfied with their current jobs and thinking about moving on and struggling between the logic brain arguing, oh, but you have a job, but you have a paycheck, but, you know, better the devil you know. <laughs> and the other part where they start to feel sick and they start to feel unwell and so forth. So you mentioned medicine doesn't sort of prepare you for, you know, doesn't train you well. What I find with corporate professionals is that if you're dealing with athletes, you understand stress, both physical and mental. You you get coached, you know, to deal with it. You get support, allied health professionals to get you out of injury and so forth. Corporate professionals don't really deal with that. They don't have that as part of their education and even a part of part of their discourse, right? So I'm going to start with Jeffrey and understand more about his personal lived experience. Have you had that in your career, Jeffrey, you know, where you felt like the stress was too much and nobody had prepared you for it? My first 10 years of corporate experience. <laughs> Oh, there you go. <laughs> so before I became an entrepreneur for the last 20 years, previous to that, I spent nearly 10 years working in the corporate environment in banking and finance, which was a very stressful 
industry and the position I was in doing wealth management was also very stressful. We had very high sales and revenue goals. There was constant pressure all the time to perform. If you didn't perform, you were out. And so the, it was very stressful. And that's one of the reasons why I don't have much hair left. <laughs> but, <laughs> and that's why mine is gray. So there you go. <laughs> but no, no one prepared me right. for that. I, I didn't really know how to handle that stress very well. It was very frustrating at times. And I wish I would have had the knowledge that I have today to know how to better deal with, with those kind of stressors and those circumstances and being more mindful of how to deal with those situations. Yeah. Randy, what does the 10 years of stress in the corporate sector does to you physically and mentally? Yeah, Renata, that's a great question. And what we do know is that you know, normally our stress responses are supposed to only kick on if there's a threat and then turn off pretty quickly once we mitigate that threat. The problem is, is that many people, especially in their early career or in the corporate world, are under constant threat, right? Or they're constant stress. Mm -hmm. So this has a whole host of effects, but sort of very quickly what it does is it increases heart rate, increases blood pressure, makes you more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. The body starts to secrete massive amounts of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which, by the way, has the lovely side effect of making you retain body fat or actually add more body fat. Additionally, what we have found now is that you also have pretty massive increases of inflammation in the body, and we can test that by blood tests. What this does is it ba basically makes you more likely to have cancer, autoimmune diseases, or even other hormone or endocrine problems. So it takes a pretty big toll, or uh, it might make your hair go gray or get a little bit thin, as Jeffrey alluded to. Yes. And we have grown up in a culture of if you work hard and if you work long enough and if you work and if you show that you're working all the time, good things will happen to you. And that is the culture that we live in now I, I see a change with the new generations sort of cutting back on work hours and being more aware of their need to build a, a balanced work-life environment for themselves but we probably have a lot of generation x professionals like myself you know in my 50s and people in their 40s that are really struggling with the decades of stress, right? Is this the reason why you decided to write the book? Yeah. I mean, basically, you know, since we're both Gen X as well, we have lived this experience because obviously there's a lot of stress even in the medical field, right? Physicians have high rates of stress. So that was a big factor. And I think really, you know, as Jeffrey had mentioned initially, it was how do we bridge the latest neuroscience, which Jeffrey hadn't really seen being used in things like organizational psychology or uh, financial biases, discussing those, that everything has been focused on working with the thinking brain, that nobody in the business world was spreading the info on how to work again with the nonverbal brain, with where your stress is actually coming from. Yeah. Yes. And I would add too, yeah. we're seeing trends now. I mean, uh, you alluded to it with younger generations, especially with Gen Z and even somewhat in the younger Gen Y millennials, mm -hmm. where they're pushing back. They see what happened to Gen X and baby boomers, their parents, their grandparents, in terms of working long hours. You know, the days of working for a company 20 years and getting gold watches, over. that's probably not coming back. In a lot of ways, companies created this monster themselves with yes. what they, how they've treated their employees. And so... I think to a certain degree, whether it's purposely or not purposely, it is retribution to a degree for organizations that have mistreated their employees and their staff over the years. And the younger generation is like, we're not going to put up with this. We're not going to live that way. We're yeah. not going to be under this kind of stress. We want to have a work-life balance. We want to enjoy our lives. And so a combination of how the younger generation has been raised and what they've seen from their own parents and grandparents, they're pushing back. And I don't think that's going to change. It's frustrating a lot of employers. But uh, like I said, they created this circumstance and now they're going to have to deal with it. That's true. I feel that even with the older generations, the pandemic and the lockdowns was really a tectonic shift in how they understood themselves and 
their careers moving forward. You see a lot of people moving out of big cities and wanting remote work and hybrid work and the employee value proposition needing to be updated and employers really struggling to figure out what to do. You know, should we be in the office or out of the office? What do we do? How do we deal with that? But look, talking specifically about the stress that comes from being unemployed, there's a lot of, we're recording this in 2024, the economy is quite slow, a lot of layoffs in the US happening and also in Australia and in the UK. The stress that comes from being out of work is substantive, right? Financially and emotionally and professionally. But I think it's exacerbated by that reptile brain, Randy, where you feel like you've been kicked out of a tribe and you're in the middle of the savannah. You're going to die if you don't find another tribe quickly. So I usually tell my clients when I'm working with them, remember that you're, it's just an interview. If you don't get this job, you're not going to die. Because I think that the body sees this as such a threat. And I'd love for you to explain that more scientifically than what I'm doing here. Yeah, actually, it's quite fascinating that you observed and noticed that. So what you were catching is this is what we call neuroception, which Dr. Poor just basically coined as his term for the nervous system's way of perceiving. And it does this unconsciously. So our nervous systems are using our senses, but they're, you know, our brains are constantly scanning the environment for signs of safety or danger. Because, of course, the number one rule is survival. If you're dead, the rest doesn't matter. What happens then is that the brain in modern times will start to assume or decide that there's danger, even if there's really not. Okay. So to those folks who are going to an interview, they consciously know I'm not going to get killed. At least I hope not, you know, by the interviewer, but their nervous system is acting as if that's a hungry tiger that's about to pounce and literally eat them and kill them. And so this is the disconnect. And while we talk about the two different parts of the brain, because your nervous system on that primitive level is acting like you're in mortal danger. It doesn't understand context. And that's part of the issue about the fact that it doesn't understand words. So that's why it also doesn't understand context and why it's so powerful, because what it's doing is it's literally triggering your survival instinct, which is exactly what you've observed. Yes. And in fact, Randy, it would be, I don't know if you have this information, but because I see clients all day, every day, and they're all looking for work. When I explain it to them, they tell me, oh, that makes sense. I never knew why I was so angry at job interviews or aggressive at job interviews or feeling like they were out to get me. You know, and of course, many people have experienced this, and I, I bet Jeffrey can relate as well. As soon as you walk out of a job interview, you immediately feel relaxed. And all of a sudden, you remember all of those great things you should have said during the interview that you forgot to say. <laughs> Can you explain, Randy, what happens to your brain once it perceives that there is no danger and all the creativity flow comes back to, to you all of a sudden? It's frustrating, isn't it? And this is part of the human condition. So what happens is when your brain, through that neuroception, says, "Woo, I'm in danger, it literally activates that survival instinct mechanism. But what happens is it actually disconnects between your instinctive brain and your thinking brain. And this is what we call the insular cortex for anybody who's fascinated with neuroscience. But there's actually a highway that connects your thinking brain with your non-thinking brain. The reason why is because your brain says, if we have to survive, everything else, thought and everything else doesn't matter. We have to allocate all our resources to survival. Later, once we've decided we're not going to be killed, then we can turn back the poor thinking brain on and let it try to figure out what to do. <laughs> so you, you can look like you're responding and talking and, and taking in that information in the interview. But if your survival instincts triggered, it's just it's not really going into your cognitive areas of the brain. Yes. I have a question for Jeffrey, but before I go there, I just wanted to say my non-thinking brain does not speak English, Randy. So I know that I am in that sort of highway zone is because I open my mouth and Portuguese comes out, even if I don't mean it to come out. So I've been in interviews where I'm the first few syllables were a Portuguese word, and then I 
you know, okay, that's not the right language. <laughs> and I can only be angry with my husband in Portuguese. I cannot be angry in English. Just doesn't flow. <laughs> But Jeffrey, you know, now, now that you've armed with all this knowledge from this interesting partnership with Randy, what is it that it has enabled you to do with your clients and with the sort of work that you do in business? Well, it allows me to keep a, a calmer, a more reserved approach, especially in a tense or an emotional type of circumstance. And part of that's from just being aware and mindfulness and being able to recognize how you're feeling at that moment in time, why you're feeling that way, and trying to connect the dots as to why that's occurring. And a lot of people don't take the time to do that. As simple as that sounds, being able to go, wait a minute, I'm feeling very tense or I'm feeling agitated. Why am I feeling this right now? What is it that's happening that's triggering this? And it could be a number of things. You know, someone said something to you at work or you're in a meeting with someone, something happens. It just something is creating some kind of emotion that you're trying to figure out why am I feeling this way and taking that moment or that step back to think about that kind of analyze and say, okay, maybe I'm feeling this way because of this reason. Once you've identified why you're feeling that way, then you can better deal with it going forward. And, and if you get triggered again, you'll better know how to not only recognize it, but how to deal with it going forward. So instead of responding in a very emotional way, you can respond in like more of a rational, logical way, not letting that emotion hamper your decision making or how you proceed going forward. Yeah, that, that's that's very important. And, you know, it's easier said than done, isn't it? Like sometimes we know we need to do it, but how do we action it? Is it possible for Randy to give us some tips on how to reduce that anxiety and that stress that professionals may have when they're in an unfortunate situation at work or they're job seeking? What are some of the tips that you can give them? Sure. And, you know, Jeffrey raises a very important point is, is that it doesn't matter that you got triggered. What matters is that you're aware that you got triggered. So, you know, if the, if the thinking brain can at least hold on to a shred of, okay, I've just been triggered because my primitive brain's freaking out, then that gives you a little bit of ability to step back, you know, have a little bit of distance so that you're not, as Jeffrey mentioned, you're not reacting to as if there's a real threat. Mm -hmm. So, you raised a great question. Well, okay, what do you do on the fly in the moment? And so this is something that we talk about in our book is that there are a lot of what we call regulation skills that a person can practice with the idea that they would find what works best for them. And what works best for you in a particular moment may change from time to time. So what are these regulation skills? Just a couple real and sort of pertinent examples from somatic experiencing which was developed by Peter Levine, we know that an important skill to try to trick your brain into getting out of the freak out is to do what we call orienting. And that's simply any animal that is looking around and checking out its environment is an animal that's not in danger. If you think about it, you know, like the bunny or deer in the headlights is a phrase we use up here for somebody who's frozen and fixed, like oh, there's danger. And what the, what the animal is doing, what the person's doing is saying, I have to look at the threat and try to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. But if we actually just start to look around and check out our environment, try to break the freeze a little, it actually in a backward way tells your brain, all right, we're not in imminent danger. We can look around. This is what animals do when we've studied them in nature. Mm -hmm. Additionally, you can do very subtle things. So you could be sitting in a chair like I am now, and I would invite the person to just sort of discreetly Take a moment to scan your body, sort of like taking the elevator out of your head. You drop down into your body. Notice where you make contact with the chair or the floor. Pick one spot where you notice that the most. It might be your rear end or back in the chair, your feet on the floor. And sort of discreetly as you breathe in, imagine that you can direct your breath to that spot of heavy contact. And then as you breathe out, the breath comes from that spot. You can do that subtly over two or three breaths and 90% of people, if not more, will say, ah, oh, I notice I'm a little more settled. Yeah, okay. so There's certain techniques that you can do to help settle your system very discreetly. You don't have to meditate or chant or do something that's going to freak out your interviewer, but that you can quickly start to regulate and calm your nervous system. Mm -hmm. That's, that's fascinating. What about Randy, the lead up? 
to an, a stressful event. So some people will have an interview coming up a week from now. And instead of spending time preparing for it, they spend time stressing about it. And I'm fascinated by this sort of sort of process that happens inside us. There's a, an interesting TED Talk, maybe you're familiar with it. It's by Daniel Levitin, I think it's how you pronounce his surname. And he talks, I think he's a neuroscientist, and he talks about all of the things that went wrong just before he was about to fly on vacation. So he, you know forgot the keys inside his house, had to break into his house, then forgot the passport when he was on his, you know, all of these sort of little mistakes that you make. And it, and I, when I, because I have seen hundreds of clients in my consultations, that's what I hear from them. Oh, you know, I suffered an accident when I was changing jobs, when I was moving house, when I was getting divorced, you know, like there was lots of things happening in their lives all at the same time. And I think even in in folklore and stories, we kind of see that happening. Oh, you know, bad things happening threes or, you know, the, oh, it's the third thing. You know, there's some little things. And, and I'm fascinated that people tend to be late for interviews or hop on the wrong train. Here in Melbourne, we use public transport a lot. You know, oh, I accidentally went on the wrong train and it ended up in a different place. <laughs> And it, it happens a lot. And, and that lead up to a stressful event tends to be a very stressful time. What tips can you give for people to calm down and not be so threatened by it? Yeah. So really, it boils down to things like practice those regulation skills when you're not under threat. Because what okay. happens, especially things like the orienting that I talk about, those, as you practice them, the nervous system starts to respond, oh, okay, we're getting a signal of safety. We can stand down. So build those skills, just like you wouldn't go into an Olympic competition without having practiced whatever sport that you're competing in. So no. it's really critical to do that. What you're describing is that tendency of the brain to disconnect. So even if you're anticipating that interview, we even see this in people with post-traumatic stress disorder, that when somebody has a high degree of anxiety in their system, they're actually more clumsy, more forgetful. And so your brain is simply acting like, whoa, we're under threat. We know what's coming. Mm -hmm. And so it's these regulation skills. And additionally, not only in being able to calm one's nervous system, there's a whole a few host of other things one can do. But also it's our connection with others. So it's really learning to reach out to others, to not isolate. As Stephen Porges talks about, the way we get through these things is through our connections. It's through our reaching out, what we call co-regulation. So mm -hmm. reach out to people who are supports to you. And of course, the usual stuff, get good exercise or activity. One of the ways you can sit and see where you make contact with the floor, but you can also get up and walk around and drop that awareness, take that elevator down, focus on the feeling of your feet walking on the ground, whether you're in shoes or not. Mm -hmm. You're learning to get your attention away from the brain and notice your body, your sensations, but also your environment around you. And that's where it starts to break that cycle of freeze, focus on the thread ahead of you. Therefore, I'm more clumsy or I'm more forgetful. Mm. Jeffrey, based on all of these things and the, the work that you also do with advisory and, you know, to clients and reaching out to HR departments to offer this sort of consulting work that you and Randy are doing, how is it being received? Do you feel like, like people understand already that there is a problem or do you need to educate them and let them know that this problem is something that it, they can fix with your help? No, I, I think it's really apparent to most people that there is a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety uh, in the workplace. You know, most people are feeling that. At the vast majority of people we find are feeling that and recognize that. So when we talk about being able to reduce stress, make better decisions under less stress, how to deal with yourself and others that you're working with in a less stressful situation, how to reduce conflicts. You know, you can use this for conflict management, for example, better interviewing potential. Even for students, because I teach at the university as well, students that have test anxiety, how to deal with that type of anxiety as well using these techniques. But there are so many applications with dealing with human stress in so many different ways with, with these techniques. 
yeah. that it, it's really quite profound. And it doesn't take having to yeah. get a degree in neuroscience or psychiatry or psychology to do this. It's the simple tips, basically, through all the advent of science that we've collected over the years and distilling it down to some very simple elements that anyone can really apply. I think for many years, employers noticed this, but the way that they were trying to solve it was very ad hoc. And it's interesting that it, it, we now make fun of it. You know, oh, here they come with a massage voucher or, you know, <laughs> some sort of balloons. And and I, I remember going into a big bank in Australia. They, at the time I was doing consulting work and they were thinking about hiring me. This was just before the pandemic and then nothing happened, of course. They were going to hire me because they were going to implement a new enterprise-wide system in finance. And everybody knew that half of the team would be made redundant after that system was fully functioning. But they had balloons all over the office and they were do doing mugs, you know. <laughs> Here's the new system. Like everybody knows that at least 30 to 40% of these people will, have, will go as soon as the system is implemented. So that lack of transparency and not really scientific way of working, the, the stress of the situation has made employees very cynical. When you start working with businesses, how are you being received by the employees and by the teams? Well, I think that's an interesting point you brought up. You know, that's an example yeah. of employers not being fully honest with their employees. And I think a lot of times mm -hmm. employers are afraid to be truly honest with their employees. The employees know what's going on. The question is, yeah. are you going Thank to support your employees and how are you going to support them? Are you going to be truthful and honest with them and disclose information that should be probably disclosed to the employees, frankly? And also, what kind of support mm -hmm. are you going to offer them? If 30 or 40% of the people are going to be laid off in that department, you're going to have to be honest with them and say, look, you know, this is probably going to happen. However, you know, we have a, a package in place if for some of you that may decide to leave or need to be let go for some reason, you know, we have these support services. You know, you need to line up a number of elements to supporting your employees. So they know that they're being supported and not tossed out, you know, out the door, so to speak. It's still going to be stressful for some. You know, losing a job or wondering if you're going to lose your job, of course, is very stressful. There's no way of completely mitigating that. But you can make that process mm -hmm. uh, more tolerable and certainly with more care and more guidance and support. And that can go a long ways with people. Yes, absolutely. I'm often surprised when I talk to executives that are looking for work, how hard it is for them to explain their leadership style. I'm wondering if Randy and I can sort of talk about leadership and some sort of issues that we discuss a lot without any scientific knowledge, Randy, I must admit, usually around the fact that it seems like a lot of our bosses are narcissists, if not sociopaths, right? So there's a lot of that feeling in the corporate world. Jeffrey is laughing, if you can't see, if you're not on YouTube. There is a book that I Frankly, I'm a very big fan of the no asshole rule. I don't know if you've read that. The no asshole rule. And then there is also one that was more scientific, written by an, an academic here in Australia called Working with Monsters. Thoroughly recommend both of them. Many of my clients have had to read them. And, and I wanted Randy to, I mean, I don't know if that's your expertise, Randy, but a lot of people struggle with their leaders, their leaders' lack of empathy, their inability to uh, communicate well, or their style being a style that's not conducive to uh, well-being in the workplace. There is also a, some research that I've read quite recently about, you mentioned stress hormones before, some research showing that this, the stress hormone is actually coming out in perspiration. So that feeling that you've had, intuition that you've had in the past, when you walk into a meeting with somebody that's really stressed, and you probably thought it was just the tone of voice or the body language, some researchers are now thinking maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's rubbing on you and it's potentially making you fat. <laughs> yeah. 
What do you think about that? I found that fascinating when I read it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So the topic of leadership, yes, that's something that I've been doing some reading and ongoing studying about because mm-hmm. obviously there are different models of business business leadership, right? And it's very fascinating to me. So if you go all the way back to the original studies, you know, where they really focused on traits, that was the original. What traits does a leader have? Mm-hmm. Um, and then if one is cynical, one can say that the traits would be sociopathic in nature or narcissistic. And Jeffrey has regaled me with many stories of fascinating people he's worked with before. Mm-hmm. And then over time, of course, there was more of a focus than an addition to traits. Well, what are kind of the skills or capacities, capabilities that leaders have? And is it more focused on, on how they can sort of approach with their bag of tricks or their tools? And then more, you know, more recently in history, there's been a focus more on how does the leader interact with, interface with, and impact the team? So there was much more of a focus on what we call the behavioral side of leadership. Mm-hmm. So ultimately, you know, as a psychiatrist and as a person who didn't start in the business world, when I stepped back and looked at all those globally, what I really see is that there are two main themes that they talk about in leadership. One is, does that person have the knowledge and the skills to basically do what they're charged to do in an organization? But the other aspect that, of course, is more down my alley is the aspect of this socialization, this interaction with each other, you know, a leader and their team or what they call the follower, right? And what you're talking about, Renata, is it it really gets back to this idea of that's a fundamental concept in what we call polyvagal theory, Borges' theory, that basically says is, as a person, do you give cues of safety or do you give cues of danger? So when you talked about, for example, stress hormones secreting, our nervous systems are actually super attuned to each other. All three of us, as we talk with each other right now, our nervous systems are checking each other out, even though we're separated by distance. And through that neuroception process, we're actually trying to determine if each of us is a threat or is not a threat. And if you go in there, if your boss or leader is what we call dysregulated, if they're angry or irritable or narcissistic, the other person's nervous system picks up on that unconsciously. And it can be through things like smelling, you know, picking up hormone vapors, or it could be, you know, through other means that the nervous system picks it up, like looking at the eye movements, the eye contact, the color of the skin tone. Is there muscle tension that you can pick up visually? You know, it's pretty easy if you think about, you can identify if somebody looks angry or sad, but sometimes it's much more subtle. It's this co-regulation. Our nervous system to feel safe wants to riff off of or co-regulate with the person in front of us. And so if that person is either a narcissist or a sociopath, Our nervous system picks up that as a cue of danger. And so, but you may not even have something verbal to trigger that. Um, So this is what you're describing is, is that each of us really have a lot more impact on each other than we give credit. Gets back to the whole point of nonverbal communication, really, when you think. That is fascinating. I, you know, I'm going to have to listen to this podcast again (laughs) to incorporate that in, in my, the work that I do with my clients. Jeffrey, what do you think about what Randy just said? Is that something that you have experienced in in your career or you're working with clients on those issues at the moment? Yeah. yeah, I was actually thinking about some of what you were talking. I was thinking about the emotional quotients Mm -hmm. versus IQ and intellectual quotients and social quotients, actually, as he was talking about this and the relationship with polyvagal theory and neuroception. But no, there's... All this really ties in, and it ties in the various leadership models, and even in, in modern day leadership methodologies, being aware, being mindful of yourself and others around you, and how you adapt to those situations is very important. And if you're, as, as Randy would say, dysregulated, so to speak, and or emotionally charged, where you're not thinking through and being mindful of the decisions that you're making, how you're responding to your environment, you know, that can have, you know, critical issues and have really profound negative effects, both on yourself, people Mm -hmm. around you. And I, you know, people who are not mindful, that are not aware of what they're doing or what they're projecting, you know, that causes a lot of problems for them. And sometimes you need to sit down with individuals 
when you see them act in ways that are not appropriate or in ways in which they're really damaging themselves on a, both a professional and social basis and, and just being quite honest and frank with them and exploring those options and talking about why these situations may be occurring, trying to get to the meat of the problem, why are they responding the way they're responding, but doing it in a way where they don't feel like you're attacking them, you know, bringing them into the fold and, and, and talking about it. And that's something probably Randy could talk a little more about in terms of, you know, how to engage someone in that type of conversation without necessarily offending someone or making them defensive. But there are soft approaches that one could take to do that. But I think that's critically important because there, most people are not really aware of how they project themselves. Yes, yes. I'd like to to talk about that in in even a, a a bigger scale because I'm fascinated by how we can spiral up or spiral down by engaging with people. Right? And in many years ago I read research where it said women have a higher risk of spiraling down if they chit-chat with each other. <laughs> so they have a tendency to Winge and winge and winge and winge and winge and winge to the point where they finish a conversation and they come out of it worse than when they started. And I have seen that with some of my, you know, group of friends being a woman, you know, identifying as a woman. And I find that really interesting. I also wonder, you know, if that is an issue, not so much with in a de gender situation, but for example, if the restructure in an organization is such where dozens or hundreds of thousands of people will be made redundant. So here in Australia, one restructure has just been announced where over 2,000 people will be made redundant by the end of the year. So lots of colleagues will now be chit-chatting. It worries me that they are spiraling down, <laughs> you know, by complaining about the company and the market, and it's a terrible year, and there's not a lot of jobs advertised, and just making it worse, coming out of a conversation, feeling worse than they were, you know, hours before. How can we engage people, Randy, in a way that we maybe stop gate that sort of situation from happening? And can we stop it? Or is it just natural for us to have those sort of conversations? And in the end, it's probably better to have conversations than no conversation at all. Yeah, that's also another really important point that you've observed is that we are hardwired to look for what's wrong. Mm. Because again, the brain looking at survival says, I would rather assume there's a problem and, and be wrong rather than not assume there's a problem and end up dead. It's sort of the extreme version of it. Right. We are hardwired. And this is why things like social media can be so powerful because anytime human beings get together, if you start with that kind of negative, stressed out, like you said, whinging, mm -hmm. it's, it's very sort of self-reinforcing. So, okay, what do we do about that? I mean, number one is just acknowledge this is how we're hardwired, that our brains are only doing what we're built to do. Because originally that was actually adaptive for us to survive when there were actual threats. These days, number one, it's like really one of the things that we teach as a foundation is this self-awareness. You know, it's the old know thyself. And that each person, the more that they're aware of how they tend to present, what their what we call their baseline autonomic nervous system state is, am I somebody, what I mean by that, am I somebody who tends to go into fight? Do I like to argue and, and attack? Or am I somebody that goes into flight? Do I want to just get the heck out of there? Um, or am I somebody that shuts down, that just collapses and becomes very passive? So if we know where we tend to go to, we then use those regulation skills. And this is one of the things that we offer with our consulting and training is really teaching a detailed list of skills that people can try mm -hmm. so that they can find what works for them and practice them. Because then if you draw on those skills, that's where you can say, oh, I'm starting to go into fight. I need to downregulate myself. So then people start to instinctively or more intuitively be able to pull on those skills to get themselves off the on-ramp onto the freeway of rage. So yeah. that this is really how we do it. And it's, it's also a matter of making a conscious decision of maybe it's good to limit how much whinging we do. I'll give myself an hour a night, you know, to go have a good whinge about things. But after that, I need to stop and I need to now try to focus on some more positive things. That could be something as simple as enjoying time with a pet looking outside and enjoying the view of nature 
when it's not 42 degrees here, or maybe you can go for a nice walk on the beach. But you know, find things that will start to feed signals of safety to your brain. And often they're actually really super simple things that, as Jeffrey alluded to, you don't need to be a psychiatrist or a neuroscientist to, to understand and to use. Yes, that is, that is, that's the right approach. I really worry about listeners that might be listening to all of these things and thinking about themselves, but it's different with me. You know, I can hear all of this, but it's different for me. And I usually hear that, especially if somebody has been unemployed for an extended period of time, that's when I think the mental state of, you know, the job seeker tends to deteriorate and they start to doubt themselves and lose a lot of confidence. What would you say to somebody who has been unemployed for quite some time? 2024 has been a really tough year. I don't know if you're following this, but you know there aren't that many jobs advertised this year for my listeners and my clientele, you know, like managers, you know, corporate professionals, people with more experience in the corporate world. So I'm okay with that. I think they will all get jobs eventually. I do. I really do. I'm like really confident about all of you guys listening, knowing that everybody will get a job eventually. It's probably going to take longer and it has nothing to do with the listener and the people looking for work. It has to do with the environment. We have elections happening, we have a war, we have, you know, a sort of a lower consumer sentiment. Organizations are just wait on a wait and see kind of environment, especially in the US at the moment. Well, let's wait and see what happens at the end of the year and then we will spend money and then we will, you know, stop the hiring freeze and so on. But how do we maintain ourselves over that long term? You know, I'm hoping to hear from both of you, you know, what would be your advice for the listeners that are thinking, oh no, it's different for me because I've been job hunting for a long time. What would you tell them? Jeffrey? Well, we're going to an election year. I, I've noticed this as a trend over multiple decades. You go into an election year, especially if there's a little bit of uncertainty with the economy, uh, whether it be on a more domestic or global level. Companies tend to tighten up, and then, in the, of course, it, it filters down to individuals. So this isn't terribly unusual. And okay. I think because of the unknowns, people get concerned, they get worried, they get frustrated, sometimes they get angry get very nervous. But at the end of the day, it's all going to be okay. It really will be. And, yeah. You know, I had the same conversation with students of mine as well. You know, they're talking about, oh gosh, we can get a job when we graduate. What's going to happen to us? So what's going to happen with the new president or what's going to happen with the economy? What's going to happen on a global scale with what's going on in the Middle East or China and Taiwan? The list goes on. There is Every mm -hmm. year, all the time, ongoing, there's always going to be issues, problems, whether it be local, national, global. It's just the way the world works. And I think we just, at some level, we have to get a little more comfortable with the fact that there's going to be change. Things are going to continue progressing forward, but trying to keep a more positive outlook. And I know it's difficult for people to do that, but really looking at, looking at the last century, the last few decades, we're still here. We're not going anywhere, right? We're progressing forward. Now, we may not like all the changes occurring all the time, but we're progressing and moving forward and things are going to be okay. Doesn't mean we may not hit some rough patches along the way. That's life. And I think having people understand that life is going to have its ups and downs, obviously, but being able to work through that with less stress and being mindful of that and using some of the techniques that Randy okay. and I certainly work with individuals regarding is very helpful in handling some of that stress and some of those difficulties. But I would just say in general to people, don't worry, it's going to be okay. It really will be. Yes. What about you, Randy? Yeah, you know, and then sort of leaping from that, you know, my role, of course, is more focusing on the individual. And it really gets back to, you know, how do you get through this is all those good self-regulation and also self-care techniques that we even use, for example, when people are dealing with depression or just okay. general anxiety that isn't related to job. So this is where it's really important to do that physical activity, get your body moving, try to focus on more anti-inflammatory foods in your diets, meaning try to avoid too many refined sugars. Because mm -hmm. if you increase inflammation, there's a lot of studies in my field in psychiatry that are showing how that negatively affects mood and anxiety. Learning the regulation skills. Maybe you want to do yoga or pick up meditation. Get some support, whether that's friends or a spiritual community or going to a therapist. 
but you know, do the things to make sure you take care of you. Another sort of researcher and thought leader in the field is focuses on self-compassion. And self-compassion is also a really huge, you see this in positive psychology, for example. Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F is her name. And okay. she does a lot of teaching and, and sort of weekend conferences and workshops to help people with that. So, because the key is, is, is if you're going into the interview and if you aren't regulating yourself or at least working on down-regulating yourself a bit, you go in stressed out and you're actually sending cues of danger to the interviewer and they're unconsciously picking that up. So it's going to make them more unsettled. So it doesn't mean it's going to ruin your interview. I don't want to spook people, but the more you can really take care of you and, and work on these regulation skills, that's going to really make a big difference in the signals that you're sending out and how you're selling yourself during that interview process. Absolutely. Now, when you are working with clients, both of you, you are working with corporate clients, right? You're working with the employer. Is that correct? Tell correct. me about the sort of work that you enjoy doing and that you're keen to expand. So if anyone is listening who has the ability to bring you on board to their organization, that they can get in touch with you. Yeah. I mean, we certainly are. What we did initially from the book is we developed an online on-demand training, which is available if they simply go to our Neuro Consulting Group website. We have links for that. And that actually provides, really kind of walks a person through all the main concepts of the book and works on some skills. And from there, we actually are have been focusing on really beefing up live trainings that either could be online or uh, in person if a corporation wishes to have us come and do a workshop, for example. And so to that effect, we actually have brought on board Dr. Abby Blakesley, who is a, a well-known psychologist in somatic psychology. And she was actually my mentor in teaching me somatic experiencing and has extensive experience teaching and talking worldwide. She loves Australia, by the way. What is somatic experience? I'm, I'm not familiar with that term. Maybe so lots of people... Sure. Yeah. So, somatic experiencing is simply a way of looking at how do you work with the person's physiology, them as a, a human animal, to help them to get over stress and trauma that has been stuck in the nervous system. So this mm. is very helpful for things like post-traumatic stress disorder, but it can also be for more simpler forms of what we call shock trauma. You could have had a bad accident, you know, hiking or rock climbing or skiing, and your nervous system goes back into that fight or flight, like eh, things are dangerous. And so Peter Levine developed the technique in the 70s as a way to really help the person to actually let go of the trauma because the traditional therapy models help to a certain extent, but it never really fully gets it out of that more primitive. Um, and people can, can just look up somatic experiencing. Their website is traumahealing.org. That's all one word. Um, and they can actually get a good feel for that. So that's a modality that I'm trained in, as well as at Dr. Blakesley, Abby. So she's really going to be working with us on trying to bring this to as many different types of organizations and industries as possible, so that it's not just those of us working in mental health that can benefit from these concepts, but also from people in the business world, which is why Jeffrey is here and so supportive and enthusiastic about bringing this to the business community. And I do know, Jeffrey, the trainings have some uh, CE credits, correct? Yes, they do. So if someone watches our trainings, uh, it's about seven hours of training that they can purchase and they can watch wow. on, on, on their own time. It's on our learning management system through our website, neuroconsultinggroup.com. It allows them to get uh, CE or PDU credits with the CFP board for certified financial planners, also for the uh, PMI, Project Management Institute, and their various certifications. Mm -hmm as well as SHRM, which is the uh, Society of Human Resource Managers. So it's awesome. Not I love it. That is very, very good. I think that the work that you're doing is groundbreaking, fantastic. Groundbreaking in the sense that it's information that organizations really should have and should implement and adopt in, in the workplace, because if it's combined with their strategies and considered as they, you know, develop growth strategies or restructure strategies or whatever it is that they need to do to keep the business going, 
it will just be so much more successful and make more, you know, and, and make everybody go through change and transition and transformation, whatever it is that they are trying to do in a more, in a healthier way, right? So I, I'm really excited when I heard about you and I'm very happy that you joined me for this chat here. I will have all the links to the work that you do and your book in the episode show notes so people can easily find you. And I was re really delighted to, you know, to talk to you and, and learn more about your work. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast. And I hope that some of the listeners will reach out to you and, and get in touch for connections. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, it's important to us, as you said, to really, this is a mission of trying to help and to be of support to people in various different business fields, because it really does make a huge difference. I mean, we're seeing that when we do in my field with people that are going to people like me. So it's only natural that this can be something that really benefits others as well. Fantastic. Thank you.